Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on bio-based products from fast pyrolysis oil. My name is James Ling. I'll be your moderator for the webinar. I'm working for Greenovate Europe, which is a European expert group dedicated to eco-innovation. Today, we've organized this webinar in the framework of the Bio4 Products project, where Greenovate Europe are responsible for the communication, dissemination, and exploitation of the project results. I won't say too much now about the project, as my excellent colleagues will explain in uh, lots of detail later on. Just to say that Bio for Products has been funded by the SPIRE Public-Private Partnership under the EU's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Uh, we're demonstrating how to transform four different types of biomass into four different sustainable bio-based products using fast pyrolysis as the conversion technology. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, you see the project partners coordinated by BTG Biomass Technology Group from the Netherlands. So this webinar is part of a series we've been organizing. One of the main ways we're looking to share the project results. As you see, today is the, the third in the series. Previously, we've focused on biomass feedstock and conversion by fast pyrolysis. Um, just to say, you can uh, catch up on these webinars via the links on the screen, or if you just search uh, on YouTube for Bio4 products. Um, we still have a fourth and final webinar, which we're going to be looking at the topic of sustainability, looking at the LCA results from the project, also how companies can use this LCA and bio-based for marketing purposes. Um, registration is now open via the link. Um, before we get started, just a couple of technical remarks. So the webinar is being recorded for future publication and the recording and the presentations will be shared shortly after the webinar. Uh, all attendees are in listen-only mode, but we really welcome your questions for the, for the speakers. Um, so if you do have questions, please enter them in the, in the question box on the GoToWebinar panel. Um, we're going to put your questions to the speakers at the end of each presentation, so please don't be shy to, to uh, write down your questions. So here we go. Here are your wonderful speakers for today. You can now uh, put a face to the names. Uh, each of them has a really interesting story to tell about the products they're developing within their respective companies. Um, so without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you the first speaker, Hans Heeres. Hans is a process engineer at BTG Biomass Technology Group. I think it's fair to say BTG are the main instigators of the Bio for Products project. So it only makes sense for Hans uh, to begin our story today. Uh, Hans, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the, for the introduction. I, I want to, to give a, a short introduction on the thermochemical fractionation and um, some of the approach and objectives of the Bio for Product uh, project and in short something about our thermochemical fractionation pilot plan. So let's start with uh, thermochemical fractionation. What, what is exactly thermochemical fractionation? Thermochemical fractionation is um, the conversion of, uh, of biomass, lignocellulosic biomass, by first of all fast pyrolysis. So biomass is converted by fast pyrolysis into a pyrolysis, uh, pyrolytic liquid, pyrolysis oil. The pyrolysis oil then can be separated into uh, pyrolytic fractions, such as acids, lignin, sugars, uh, or extractives. Um, in uh, separating the pyrolysis oil, the, these, the key biomass functionalities are retained in, the, in these fractions. This uh, um, pyrolysis oil fractionation is done by, uh, it, the process is based on liquid-liquid uh, extraction. Um, in this uh, way, enabling the separation on basis on, of, uh, of functionality. Um, each of the fractions uh, produced in thermochemical fractionation can be used as a raw material in uh, bio-based uh, products or serve as a starting point for further dedicated uh, conversion. Um, in thermochemical fractionation, 
no byproducts or wastes are produced. If we have, for example, one of the fractions has a, lot, lot, a, a higher demand for, there's a, for example, if there is a higher demand for one of the fractions, uh, the, the, the other fractions, the excess of other fractions can be mixed back into the pyrolysis uh, oil uh, to be used as a, as a fuel. Then we go to the bio for products project. Um, bio for products is a EU funded Aspire a funded project running from September 2016 until September 2020. Um, in bio for products, we uh, want to convert four different uh, bio resources by thermochemical fractionation into uh, fractions which can be used as raw material, material for the development of four different end products. In bio for products, the biomass uh, feedstocks are delivered by CAPAX. BTG is doing the thermochemical fractionations and we are also doing the coordination of the project. Um, uh, the lignin is used by Axion, as you just heard, uh, in two different uh, phenol formaldehyde resin applications. And the sugars are used by uh, TFC and Foreco in, uh, in uh, wood uh, modification applications. And TFC also use, uses the sugar um, in the production of foundry resins. Furthermore, we have uh, Evotech looking at the business feasibility of the project and Green of Fate uh, is doing the communication and dissemination. In bio for products, we also want to design and construct and operate a, a thermochemical fractionation pilot plant uh, with an input capacity of three tons a day. Um, so we go from a continuous bench scale unit with a TRL of four to six to seven. Furthermore, important if we look at the different applications for example, the uh, replacement of uh, fossil phenol by the lignin. We want to replace the fossil phenol in these res resins by 30 to 65 percent uh, by pyrolytic lignin. Uh, in wood modification applications, we want to replace uh, 100 percent of, uh, of creosote by the pyrolytic sugars. And looking at the foundry resins, we want to replace 30 to 65 percent of our furan-based uh, resin. Um, Furthermore, we also look at the techno-economical and environmental assessment of the whole value chain. Then something about uh, the fractionation pilot plant we have built here at BTG. Um, the partners in uh, Biofor products will also develop their products on a, on a pilot scale. So there is a need for larger uh, quantities of raw material. This means we have to build a pilot plant. We will scale up a, a continuous bench scale fractionation unit with an oil input of 12 and a half kilograms an hour to a pilot scale with an input of 125 kilograms an hour. The heart of this pilot plant are uh, liquid liquid extractors. Uh, it also consists of multiple uh, concent concentrators. And this fractionation pilot plant is placed next to our pyrolysis uh, pilot plant. Um, so the input of this fractionation pilot plant is the output of the pyrolysis pilot plant. The pyrolysis pilot plant is able to produce three tons a day of pyrolysis oil. The fractionation pilot plant is able to convert to process three tons a day of pyrolysis oil. Uh, we commissioned this fractionation pilot plant uh, in, the, in the, at the end of 2018. Um, so we use process oil uh, produced from our uh, process pilot plant, but we also, uh, let's say we want to have standard oil, we uh, use oil produced by Empiro in, in Hengelo. We did multiple tests uh, in production runs with this pilot plant, and we, now, we are now at a proven input capacity of uh, about 105 kilograms an hour, which means 84% uh, of the design capacity. Uh, the product properties and yields, we tested that, so the lignins and the sugars, and they are similar to the, to the fractions we obtained in our bench scale um, unit. So that was in short an introduction on the thermochemical fractionation, uh, the objectives of bio for product and our fractionation pilot plant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Very interesting. I'm happy you were able to make the presentation now. Sorry for the difficulties. Um, well, I think that nicely sets the scene uh, for the for the rest of the presentations to come. So for now, I don't have a direct question for you. 
Um, ah, yes, I do. Just in time. So just one short question. Um, the key, what are the key differences found on the sugar yield? Or, well, let's say, second question, or maybe it's one larger question. Key differences found on the sugar yield or thermochemical fractionation performance of different biomass feedstocks? Yeah, there, there, there can be a little little difference in, uh, in let's say ratios of fractions produced. If you use a biomass fix feedstock, which contains a little bit more cellulose and hemicellulose, you will also see this back in your in your in your oil, so in your fraction yield. And a second quick question: um, What's the future perspectives and the obstacles to to upscaling or commercial scale production? Yeah, for further up, upscaling, of course, you need uh, to have a uh, to have an output. You, you, you need to have customers who uh, who, uh, who are using your fractions. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to further uh, scale up. So that's the most and most important one to to create output uh, of the fraction fractions. Okay, very good. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Hans. So now I'll introduce um, Malika. Malika is a group leader for product development at Hexion, which is a multinational chemicals company. She works in the R&D section uh, in Isalon, Germany. Um, today, Malika will present their product development using pyrolytic lignin feedstock. Malika, over to you. Thank you very much, James, for this introduction. So um, I'm working for Hexion Germany and our main business is to produce a phenolic specialty resins here in our plant in Lettmarte. Hexion is a global orientated company and we are also producing different um, chemicals, for example, epoxy resins, but here we are concentrated in phenolic resin chemistry and also um, as part of the project we have been concentrating on replacing a part of phenol that is fossil based, that the bio-based uh, raw material called lignin and we are very happy that we could be part of the project that started 2016 and currently we are doing the last steps to finish it. It will finish this year and I'm very happy that you are joined us today and I can present you something about the research results of the last four years. So um, I will change the slides to the next one. Uh, hopefully you see the second one. So table of contents is that first I'm going to present our work the lignin and then I'm going to say a little bit more about the development of insulation foams and also about molding compounds and then I will tell you something about our general motivation why we are believing that this makes sense and this is leading into the future. So uh, first of all within this project we work with totally different lignans. So they are in general called pyrolytic lignans, but we use lignans out of different feedstocks. And to get a good idea about what chemical components do we talk, we uh, were doing also analysis, so lignin characterization, um, and checked how much um, how much phenol or how much different other compounds are within this lignin structure what we currently use. And then uh, we did also a lot of uh, screening tests of the different lignans that were provi provided within this project and then um, we checked what is the most suitable for us for, for the phenol replacement and we introduced the most suitable lignans into different resins and also we have a high um, variety of end applications so we check that what type of resin can work for what type of end application. Um, finally, we are also capable of doing some application tests in our labs here in Germany and uh, we got preliminary results that are of course 
useful if you want to go to um, your end customers and advertise your product. So here you have a quick overview. So within all these work within the four years, we could identify um, two suitable applications for the lignin and the first one was um, foams for the insulation market and the second one are the molding compounds. And during the next slides, I will go into a few more details and let you know what did we do and where are we currently and what type of, uh, what type of application uh, do we consider to work further. So um, what did we do um, to develop these uh, insulation foams? So first, if you look at picture number one, uh, we synthesized a new resin. The resin is our the resin synthesis is our main business. So we are not selling the end applications. We are selling phenolic resins, and we synthesize a lot of different lignin-based resins. Um, and then, of course, uh, we also played with the amount of lignin, and we did all the resin characteristics because also they are very important. Um, something like viscosity of the resin or also solid content. And then we found after a few years research, we found an optimum and we started the application test. And you can see this in picture number two. So uh, we uh, mixed the resin with uh, different additives in a heated mold to get an impression um, if it works. And of course, also there you have a lot of different parameters where you can play with. You can play with the amount of additives, you can play with the temperature during the curing. And um, in picture number three, you see the outcome. So we got a foam panel out of the mold. And this is a foam panel made out of, of phenolic resin. And then we continued our test and we uh, did in-house testing, for example, in picture number four, you see the, the cell content. So we determine open and closed cells. We did some fire tests internally. We looked at thermal conductivity and we also did friability to get an impression um, if the, the resin that we used and the additives that we used to get a foam um, are working together in a way that we are getting a final product with acceptable properties. So here you can see uh, two nice pictures. So um, during the development of the insulation foams, we uh, first identified the most suitable lignin types in terms of feedstock. And uh, we could also see that uh, we made an internal ranking, what is good for us and what not. And you could also see that when we synthesized resins with uh, lignans that were higher ranked, we could, we could get foams with better properties in comparison to the lower ranked lignans. And if you look at the picture on the right side, so they're just a snapshot of all the foams we did. So a very small um, impression that you can get here of all the work done. And uh, the first one, number one, is a reference foam because it's always quite important that you are comparing your new bio-based resins with a standard phenolic resin. And there you see sometimes you have, for example, in picture number two, you have big holes and also in number three, there are smaller holes. In picture number seven, block seven, there are even bigger holes. So there was a lot of research done to find an optimum recipe and an optimum foaming formulation because um, <laughs> what is important for foam that should insulate, it's of course the insulation. And if there are big open holes, then you can imagine that it will not have good insulation. So it's of no use. Um, we also tried different substitution grades of phenol um, to check where we can find an optimum. And um, this will be presented in the next slide, what we found really, what is optimum in our lab experiments. Of course, um, when we have customers who are also interested to test that they have um, more experience of insulation forms, more formulations, so they can give us valuable feedback um, 
by trying our bio-based resins. But one thing that you should be aware is that if you look at the second picture, uh, the lignin-based resins are always a little bit darker than the normal ones that are purely phenol-based. And because of that, also the insulation foams are a little bit darker later. Um, here you can see that in a very nice way in the picture. So the two on the top are made of lignin and the one on the bottom is made of pure phenolic resin, no bio-based materials inside. And there you can see a clear difference in the picture. So I, on the last slide, I told you that we are also doing a lot of different substitution grades and um, we could substitute up to 30, 40, 50 percent, but finally we checked the properties and we uh, came up with the idea to have a substitution of only 10 percent because you have to think about the end properties that are most important. I can make you any type of resins, but if they do not work, finally in the end application, that's very unfortunate. So we have to consider that also. And with a 10 percent substitution, uh, we got a improved reaction and resistance to fire that uh, we have seen here in our labs. And we also did tests like compression strength and we had also an improved compression strength in comparison to a standard phenolic resin. So the lignin does not, uh, is not only bio-based, um, but it also gives additional positive properties. That's very, very impressive. And we got an improved elastic modulus in our, with our in-house tests and also the other properties maintained at excellent values. That's also quite impressive. When you look at the cross section, you also see that the foam is um, quite even. There are not really big holes inside, so we could also got an equal distribution of the resin and foaming structure. So that was also very nice. Um, on the bottom, you see two pictures. The left one is the normal fossil based phenolic um, resin and the right one is the one with lignin. And there you can also clearly see that this brownish panel has, a, has smaller holes in comparison to the one on the left. So you do not get so much mass loss and the resistance of fire is um, better than at this standard for foam. Um, to, to go one step further, we tried, of course, um, to, to look if we can scale up the things that we have done in the lab also to our pilot plant. And um, we did that. So uh, we made the proof of principle that also bigger amounts of phenolic resins can be produced with this um, project lignin. And also then we made uh, a few more panels with these bigger batch and also they had uh, similar values that we um, obtained with the lab batch and also the resin and the foam passed our internal tests. So that's good news um, when you are considering the next stage that would be of course industrial production. Um, okay, so now, now I switch the, uh, the topic. So the foam um, has been presented and I'm coming to the molding compounds. So um, I don't know if uh, molding compounds are familiar to everyone, but uh, we are not only a phenolic resin producer here in Lettmarte, Germany, but also molding compound producer. And molding compounds you see on the uh, left and also on the right side at the pictures, it's a type of granulate that you can uh, you buy here uh, at our site and then you can process this granulate for example with injection molding or you can also press it to different shapes and there are a ver variety of applications for example um, in automotive industry or in household you just um, have to have a machine and you have to have a tool and depending on the size of the tool and the shape of the tool you can make anything you like. For example, a typical application for household are pan handles because they have to be heat resistant and um, everybody who has a pan at home has a probably a pan handle and the black um, pan handle is based um, out of, uh, is done out of molding compounds. So we have also in-house testing here and uh, we basically 
uh, pro produce the molding compounds. You see on the uh, left, uh, sorry, on the right side, the standard molding compound, it's black. And on the left side, the bio-based molding compound that is brown. So the brown color results from the lignin we use. And um, then we made out of this granulate uh, some tension rods that you can see in the middle um, by using injection molding. So it was processable by injection molding the granulate. And then uh, we, of course, uh, checked the mechanical properties because this is the first indication if the material that we produced uh, does meet the specifications in comparison to a standard material. And uh, we were able to get in this nearly the same range than a standard material and um, we are ready from our side to uh, process this um, molding co the molding compounds together with industrial partners because of course you have to think about um, that the tests we are doing here in-house are a first indication that it can work but when you're doing application tests at the customers um, they have um, more knowledge and they really know what type of parameters they need for their specific end application that would be the next step um, for commercialization of these grades. So um, to everybody who's currently listening, um, there's always the question why, why to start? Why should I start to investigate bio-based materials? Why should I put them in our in the portfolio? So there are a few things that you have to consider. First, you have a lower dependence from fossil resources in general that you know will be, of course, limited in the future. Um, you may get novel characteristics and features if you introduce lignin into the resins, as we did. Uh, sometimes you get also improved properties, and uh, these have to be verified by you at the end application, of course. Um, you have the sustainability benefits and maybe uh, when you really want to do this, use that for marketing, you can look to get a bio certification of the end product and you are the next one who can offer your customers new innovative products. That's probably quite important if you think about all the discussion that is currently ongoing with climate change and so on. So you can be part of a greener future if you try to test the product. And I, I'm, I was very happy. So this is the last slide. I was very happy that we as Hexion could be um, part of this project and uh, we had very, very good partners um, in our consortium so that we could develop within this four years um, new sustainable products that can be brought potentially also to the end markets. So thank you very much for listening and um, hopefully there are a few questions so that I can uh, have a chat with you. So thank you. Thanks very much, Malika. That was excellent. Um, yeah, if you just stay stay on the line for a minute, I've got one question to put to you. Um, so a question from uh, Rise Energy Technology Center. What product qualities are you looking for to determine the quality of the lignin? You mentioned the visual inspection for holes, but other than that, is there any other analysis that you conduct or could be conducted? Uh, yeah, so um, the the specifications always depend on the end product and depending on your end application, you have different characteristics that should fit. So um, when you make a foam panel, of course, the visual inspection, if there are holes or not, is an important one and it's also easy to do. On top of that, uh, we had to look at different um, other properties, for example, at thermal conductivity, because as I said, thermal conductivity is a value, um, how good your foam insulates. When you put it on a building, you want that the insulation value is good because then you are warm inside in winter and it's a little bit cold outside, uh, also inside in summer. So for foams, it's for example, um, the, um, the structure from the outside, but also you do measurements like thermal conductivity. And uh, you have to be aware that if you put lignin into these 
um, foams. It's it's also reacting in your molecule with the molecules, and then you have to check um, how does the new molecular structure with you in what you introduce impact the end product. And we could manage by adjusting the parameters that the impact on the end product was positive. Okay, thanks for that. Um, just a second question. Um, do you have any idea why the properties of the foams with higher lignin substitution are worse? Um, uh, yes, we, we, we have some some ideas, some indications. Um, uh, lignin is uh, not as reactive as phenol, and if um, you introduce higher amounts, probably um, the cross-linking density is reduced because the um, reactive uh, groups at the lignin molecule are reduced, and then you get uh, worse properties. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we will leave it there. If there's more questions for Malika, we will probably have a short Q&A at the end of the webinar when, if we have a little bit of time left. So don't be shy to uh, send in a couple more questions. Um, well, now we move on to Hans Hoidonks. Um, Hans is Business Development Manager at Transfurance Chemicals, a Belgian company specializing in bio-based chemicals. Um, Hans, uh, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, James. Uh, I will first give a um, introduction of TFC, Transfurance Chemicals, uh, as <clears throat> we are not that uh, uh, well known uh, as a company, maybe to uh, the most of the uh, attendees here in the um, in the webinar. Uh, and then I will um, uh, talk a, a little about um, the use of the pyrolytic fractions in um, wood modification. Um, and that will be also the introduction uh, to Mr. Sturi uh, from Foreco, talking more in detail how these fractions uh, can be used in combination with other chemicals um, to modify wood. Next slide. This is um, a bit of an overview of transfurance chemicals. Um, we are also a biomass based company, so we produce chemicals from biomass um, uh, in Belgium, in Geel. Um, we produce more than 40,000 tons of product every year in a full continuous. Uh, chemical plant. Um, we make uh, furfur alcohol, we have other uh, furfur alcohol derivatives and we also make polymers. Our market itself is not in Belgium. Sadly, uh, we export more than 98% of our uh, total volume. Um, we have a team of around about 40 people uh, in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, we have also some operations around the world, but in Belgium we're with 40 people, um, where seven of those are working in uh, business development or working in research and develop, because that's that's actually uh, what this, these people's responsibility is. So quite an amount of people active in research. Um, our ownership, interesting to note, um, we were originally founded in Belgium by Quaker Oats, uh, you know, the, the company from the from the cereals. They founded um, the, the the chemical company here in, in Belgium. Originally, uh, Quaker Oats was also our raw material producer. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, later. Um, and now we're currently um, under the ownership of, a, of the largest uh, American uh, Sugar Group, uh, which has a plantation called Central Romana, the sugar cane plantation on the uh, Dominican Republic. Um, but I'll, I'll explain our link uh, with that in the next slide. 
we as a as a company we have been producing biomass based chemicals for almost more than 40 years uh, since 72 and um originally all our <clears throat> chemicals they went into very or in heavy industry um mostly foundry and uh, refractory uh, applications about 15 to 20 years ago uh, we developed a strategy to also make other products with our chemicals it was a bit of a uh, a sad story that we had these biomass based chemicals but they all disappeared into heavy industry um, and we started developing um, new um, applications of our uh, chemicals in bioproducts uh, this is something that we started a long time ago looking for applications of our chemistry outside the traditional applications outside the heavy industry and into a market where or into markets let me put it that way into markets where we thought biomass based chemicals have an advantage you can argue that in heavy industry uh, especially 20 years ago um, and, and and before there was no interest in having biomass based chemicals the, the the function of the chemicals was the most important and of course the price the chem being that they were solely biomass based was of nobody's interest on the other hand currently that's also changing even even in heavy industry now we see that people are taking notice that chemicals that they're using are not coming from crude oil but they're coming from biomass as a biomass based industry this is our raw material so we we, we utilize uh, sugarcane uh, of course 70 percent of all our uh, biomass that we use in our group is uh, is uh, sugarcane and sugarcane um, uh, is uh, is a is like grass in your garden. Um, you can uh, you, you plant it every or you seed it every 15 years, and then as long as there's rain and sunshine, it grows. Um, so that's also what sugarcane does. It grows when there's rain and sunshine. You harvest it to um, to extract the sugar, and the chemical operation that we run is based on the waste of the sugarcane. That's in the next slide. So you see when you um, the the plantation that we're uh, linked with in the Dominican Republic um, has um, several million tons of uh, of sugarcane harvest every year, and of course you plant sugarcane to have sugar, um, not to make chemicals uh, intrinsically, but after the sugar is extracted. You get bagasse, and bagasse can be converted into furfural by a thermal process, um, like a, it's a process which which is resem uh, resembling like a high pressure cooker that you have in your kitchen, and you dehydrate the pentoses in the bagasse. You make furfural, you distill it, make it high purity, and then it comes to Belgium, where we hydrogenate it into Furfuril alcohol. Furfuril alcohol production is the main operation that we have in Belgium. That's also the key constituent of the resins and the chemicals uh, that we further manufacture downstream. This is our plant. Bit, bit of a bigger uh, picture, whereas you see uh, on the left hand side. Um, you see the, uh, the the hydrogenation plant, and on the right hand side, I don't know if you can see my my pointer. This is here our polymer production plant, controlled from a control room over here, and the whole thing runs uh, 24/7. Sorry, I have to turn off my phone. Um, aside the production that we have in um, Belgium. Uh, here we also have a quite big logistic uh, center where we store uh, chemicals and we also ship chemicals by ship. Um, this is not our ship, but we can also ship by canal to the port of Antwerp or to the port of Rotterdam. 
what are the main markets for our uh, chemicals currently? Uh, one is industrial applications, heavy industry, as I said before. In heavy industry, the biggest application is foundry industry. What 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 do we do there? And I will not go into all the detail there, but uh, what do we do there is a uh, 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 furfuryl alcohol based resin is mixed into sand, um, and that sand is then hardened by the furfuryl alcohol, and that hardened sand form is the mold in which you cast your metal. So it's a very thermally resistant uh, binder, um, which uh, which survives. Uh, liquid metal contact uh, at 1300 degrees C. We also have some applications in refractory and anti-corrosion, but uh, that's, I will not go into detail there. Another application of our chemicals is in building and construction, and that more specifically in modified wood. And that's also the application that we, um, or one of the applications that we looked into in the Biofer products um, project. Foundry. What do we do in foundry industry? <clears throat> we make or we supply binders for very heavy castings. So you see on the picture there um, the the technology that we uh, offer to the uh, to the foundry industry is to make very heavy castings like uh, parts for wind turbines, which you see here. This is a wind turbine hub. We make or our customers make parts for hydroelectric plants. This is one for Norway. Uh, the hydroelectric uh, plant, or very heavy diesel engines. You see the guys here standing in the bottom of a of a of a pit, where they are assembling a a ship diesel engine in a sand form. So this is actually the sand form that you see here, and that sand form is made with a furfuryl alcohol based binder. Within the project, we also we are also looking into utilizing uh, uh, pyrolytic um, biomass fractions as well in those formulations, um, which is by itself interesting to do, but I will not go into detail uh, about this in this presentation because that would dilute a little bit your attention to the message that uh, we would like to bring uh, together with the uh, Other applications is refractory, but that has not been looked into within this project. Modified wood in itself, um, Mr. Turi from Foreco will go into more detail about this, but basically what you do is you take a uh, pine, an impregnatable uh, wood species, fully porous uh, material, and you inject a, um, uh, a, a, a resin system, a water diluted resin system into the wood and you allow it to polymerize. What that does, intrinsically is you make something like a wood plastic composite but um, that will be um, not to disintegrate the wood completely you leave the wood as it is but you inject a resin solution uh, in the wood and you allow it to harden so you intrinsically uh, uh, reinforce the wood from inside out with a polymer structure the resins, the base resins for this are uh, polyfurfuryl alcohol um, resin systems. So those are the resins which make the polymer inside the wood um, after hardening. Um, polyfurfuryl alcohol resin systems or furfuryl alcohol resin systems uh, more in general are acid catalyzed systems. So you need an acid in order to initiate uh, polymerization. That can be a strong or a mild or a latent acid. And what you do is you, you start a polycondensation reaction. So you start to split off water molecules <clears throat> from uh, oligomeric chains and you link the oligomeric chains together. That's what's happening here. When the chains have been linked, you also, the chains uh, are conjugated. So it's a conjugated system and they make diels alder bonds that you see over here. And then after you, after the temperature is, or you do a, a curing, a high temperature curing reaction on your polymer, you dehydrate your dils alder bonds and you make a fully cross, 3D cross-linked resin system. These resin systems are the backbone 
of our technology. On the other hand, we're always looking, or as a, as a company, we're always looking to chemistries which work um, together um, with these uh, polyphyphyl alcohol resin systems. We have looked at many different biomass-based uh, chemistries, but we came across the pyrolytic sugar fractions, which, were, which are being developed and manufactured by BTG, and we found that the pyrolytic sugar fractions uh, developed within the biofuel products project and also before that those were very um, uh, those were uh, compatible with our uh, resin systems so basically what we started to do is we started adding uh, pyrolytic sugar fractions to the fractions that uh, Hans Hedes just talked about uh, from his fractionation plant and we started them um, started to integrate them in polyphyphyl alcohol resin systems the resin system itself, they're thermoset resin. So what does that mean? It, it means that um, after curing, it forms an infusible uh, cross-linked network, um, meaning that it does not, uh, it cannot be remelted. It has no thermoplastic, no, uh, um, uh, no uh, um, uh, molecular molecular rearrangement is possible uh, with these resins at a higher temperature. On the other hand, as well, when you cure these resins, they make energy. They are exothermic uh, curing systems. So you see here in the picture some DSCs of uh, polyphyphyl alcohol, uh, pyrolytic sugar fractions, um, being subjected to a, a <coughs> calorimetric ex uh, experiment. And you see that they, that they contain quite some chemical energy. You see uh, 135, uh, 130. 22 joules per gram so that's the energy which comes out of the curing reactions of these mixtures the the way how to make modified wood is very simple you take pine any any pine will do as long as you in, can impregnate uh, an aqueous solution into it then you make an aqueous solution of your resin system, meaning that you make your formulation of chemicals, you add water uh, to obtain a certain solid content or a dry resin content in your um, impregnation solution. You force it by vacuum and pressure into your wood. And then you have soaking wet wood, of course, which you need to dry and we, which you need to harden and that you do in a furnace. Um, that's the picture here on the right. That's our pilot plant um, in Holland where we can convert um, impregnated uh, pine wood into a dark material. And that dark material that you see over here is again wood, but it is a modified wood. What that is due to the properties of the wood, you increase the density a lot. So you increase density by 20, 30, 40%. So you make the, the wood much heavier, but also you change the properties of the wood. So you make it stiffer, you make it more stable, uh, and also you increase the durability of the wood, meaning that you reduce the, um, the um, <clears throat> resist, you, you um, uh, increase the resistance to fungal attack. Within the project, we did a wide range of uh, screening and development of how to use pyrolytic sugar fractions together with PFA, polyphyphyl alcohol, in these um, uh, formulations to make modified wood. What does that mean? You have to make a lot of small wood samples and you have to test them for durability. So all of these um, uh, test series uh, have been subjected to either um, uh, soil box testing. That means that you put uh, small strips, you see like over here, you put small strips of wood into a, um, into a, a, a soil culture, which is very aggressive, uh, which is ended with uh, uh, decaying fungi <clears throat> to control the decay rate of your wood or on the other hand a um, um, lot of samples uh, have been made to do uh, uh, monocultural fungal testing that is tests where you subject um, um, the wood samples to a single uh, 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 fungi and to test uh, the attack mode of that uh, fungus against the wood. Uh, this is a very long and uh, time consuming and also labor consuming process, but it builds a lot of experience and it builds a lot of knowledge of how these two systems 
um, can work together. Basically, what we did in the project is to develop a catalytic system, which apparently works very nicely together with uh, PFA and also works very nicely together with poly, uh, with pyrolytic uh, sugar fractions. <clears throat> to come short there, we also made initially uh, last year, we already started making demonstration applications with this technology, and that resulted in a first demonstration of the project, which was a bench uh, in the shape of a heart, made with um, <clears throat> made with uh, a combination of polyphenol alcohol and pyrolytic sugars, um, and it worked well. So the material which came out of production was uh, easily machinable. Um, it was um, it had a nice uh, color and a nice finish to it, and that was really the starting point um, within uh, the project for demonstration applications. And those demonstration applications are currently being taken further by Foreco. Uh, it's a, a Dutch company who is actually um, piloting um, these uh, systems within the Biofer uh, project. It brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. So um, if you have questions, uh, I still have some time to answer those. Thanks very much, Hans. A couple of questions for you. Um, one about the strategic interest for TFC of being in, in bio for products, actually. Come again, I didn't, the, the line was not very good. Okay, um, the question was regarding the strategic interest for TFC to be in, in the Bio for Products project. Ah, okay, it is as I said, <clears throat> we're always looking for um, technologies um, and uh, chemicals to work together with uh, our uh, base technology and our base chemicals. So we see this as a means to broaden and to um, uh, improve our uh, technology. Okay, um, a couple of uh, more technical questions, let's say. Um, the yield of furfuryl alcohol from a ton of bagas, um, and secondly, maybe I can just add it, um, do you have any comparison or do you use any comparison um, comparing the production of the same chemicals from from crude oil rather than rather than sugarcane mm. so um, um, the, the, the 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 technical yield the weight based yield from one ton of gas to food free alcohol is about on a dry basis about ten percent. Um, that you can extract so uh, that's that's the, the weight based yield um, on the other hand you cannot make free alcohol from crude oil so it's a, it's a it's an impossible technical route well that's uh easily answered then yeah. um that's perfect thank you very much hans you'll be on the line for a bit longer if we have any more questions right sure sure okay perfect um well, with that, I'm going to pass on to uh, our fourth and final speaker. Um, so that's Adam Turi. Adam is process engineer at Foreco, which is a timber company in the Netherlands. Um, they offer a large range of wood products and they're working on a number of innovations to add sustainability and quality. So over to Adam to tell us more. Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Turi. Hi. Um... Today, I want to speak about Fauna Wood, which is the improved modified product of biofur products. This modification treatment based on the impregnation of bio-based resins and uh, wood residues. We are relatively new in this project. Therefore, I want to start my presentation with a short introduction of our company. Um, it's working, yeah. Um, our goals and aims in this project. So we are Foreco, a company with more than 30 years of experience in wood preservation. We are always wanted to be a key player in wood modification and new innovative product development. As a timber company, we do believe in sustainability and circularity. And um, 
because we are the end users of fast, fast paralysis uh, resins, we are creating products for customers. Our main role is to listen to these uh, needs and, and then translate to the specifications of modified wood and the process resin system. We have two products uh, in this project uh, where we want to enhance the properties, and that's fauna wood, and the other one is twin wood. And today I want to talk about fauna wood. But the first question is what fauna wood exactly? So fauna wood is this nice the brown, brown pole on the right, if you can see my cursor, and uh, which main application right now is a fencing alongside the roads. Here comes also the name fauna wood, uh, which separates the animal kingdom, fauna, from the roads. The raw material of the product is European pine wood on the left, and mostly from Germany. So we can also have a lower impact on the environment on a shorter transport time. But how is it made and what's, what are, why are we modifying wood? The how it's made, it's already covered by Hans, but uh, as to make it more and more general, really like an, uh, a general description, um, if you have, um, if you have, um, if I think everyone knows when you have a piece of wood, like a cutting board, and when you wash it, it becomes really wet. And yes, it is harder to dry. So we have the opportunity to put other chemicals inside the timber products, which will increase the specification. So then it's, it's called impregnation. Then we have the drying and curing, uh, which is a fixation process of the resin. So these resins are not leaching out. And, but the question is, why we are doing this whole process. As also Hans described, but I'm also going into more in detail, and it makes the more product more durable. If you put these poles into, into the ground, it won't be rotten in a shorter time. Therefore, you need a longer uh, maintenance time. And this is something what our clients want. This has to be the highest as possible. It becomes also greener. We don't use toxic chemicals. It won't destroy organisms in the forest or next to the road. It, um, it becomes sustainable. So the wood and, re and, wood and resins are, are renewable materials. And most importantly, it is circular. It has a possibility of waste treatment. What does it mean? Uh, imagine that during the building of a fence, a pole is broken. This can happen, right? Now, in this project, we have the opportunity to send this pole to BTG, uh, which going to grind it, dry it, process it, making fast paralysis oil which can be sent to TFC, who's making a stable resin system, which is compatible with the wood cells. As, as Hans said, they're making a lot of screening and they're making a, a, a perfect resin system, which, can, which will be sent eventually to Foreco, where we, where we make uh, modified timber products. This last step makes a, the circle complete, making a unique approach of wood modification with wood. We, of course, have challenges to develop this new enhanced product. We want to use the least resin as possible to keep it cost effective, but the durability has to stay high. Because it's a research project, we have no idea about the industrial production, if the resin will be stable, the reactivity will be constant, etc., etc. And because we're working with orders, we have to take into consideration the production standardization, the production time, the production loop time, the, the loop time and how big the stock have to be, um, etc. The biggest impact on this, these challenges is the flexibility of the resin system. It has to be perfect. And perfect means, means, means durable. We tried out the different resin system made by TFC. Here you can see one of them, PSGR92. It has different treatments and uptakes. And as you can see, the treatment of temperature had a low effect on the durability class. Uh, and of course, HOB1 is the highest. Um, we have, we have also another uh, resin system uh, with one type of treatment. Here I'm still missing the durability class uh, values because it's still in a test. So we have some promising results and we are looking forward to continue with the testing. But we have, when we have the flexible resin system, we'll have further development. Uh, then we can think about new applications, like for example, boards of other wool spaces. We can think about the other designs, what the client wants. We can make this pole square shape, holes in it. But with every new product, there's a new challenge. The du durability has to stay high. That's what our clients and customers want. And uh, we can execute other relevant tests, for example, strength test, shrinking and swelling, 
uh, and on the environmental test. We already did one in the in this project. We calculated the environmental effect of a single pole. Uh, this is in Dutch. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but you can see on the left, you can you have the shadow cost, which is calculated by the cost of of materials like CO2, gas, etc., which is consumed during the production, and these costs are added together. And found a wood, as you can see, very low value. Uh, we see here pretty promising results in this whole project, and uh, with a unique circular opportunity, which makes us enthusiastic about the upcoming tests. So um, yeah, we are looking forward to the future and what this project eventually gonna gonna yeah mean to us. It was a quick, quick one, so I'm looking forward for the cast questions. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, yeah, a question already. Uh, are you already selling the the fauna wood? We have we have a product. We have a product. It's it's we we are selling it, but not in this enhanced materials. Uh, we are really working for it to put as a sugar fraction, make it more circular. But it's it's on the market. Yes, without the sugar fractions. Okay, thanks very much, Adam. Thank you. Um, just checking now. Um, okay, I have a question here for Malika. Are you still on the line? Malika, are you still there? Yes, I'm still on the line. I had to unmute myself. Perfect, perfect. Um, so the question is regarding the molding compounds um, and what percentage of lignin you're using there. Um, the mold, it, it's um, in the molding compounds. There are a lot of different raw materials combined, and one part of the molding compounds is also phenolic resin. And we targeted this phenolic resin, and in this phenolic resin, we tries to substitute the phenol up to 50 percent. Okay, thank you Malika. Thank you. Um, a question also for Hans Hoydonks. Hans, are you still around? Sure. Okay, there's a question about um, the motivation for being in the Dominican Republic with your sugarcane. Hans, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. So, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> um, I went, um, I did not go into the, the whole detail of, uh, of the biomass, uh, background of our operation. So the reason, um, why we are um, linked uh, with uh, a Dominican or an American uh, sugar company is, is historical. There is no, there is no um, reverse motivation to uh, be there uh, deliberately. It is it's for historical reasons. On the other hand, uh, we obtain raw material from uh, from all over the world, so it's not limited. Uh, neither uh, specific um, to the Dominican Republic. Okay. Thanks very much, Hans. Um, I think I'm going to round round the uh, round off there. Um, thank you all for the questions and for your contributions. Um, certainly, if you have more questions, uh, I think. All of the presenters have shared their their emails there on the slides so you can always write to them directly otherwise you should have my email address within the organization material and the emails you've previously received um, just to flag up again the the series um, if you weren't able to join us on our previous webinars then you can uh, re-watch those online um, we're having another webinar in april um, the date's not shown here but it's april the 7th 
um, we're, we're going to be talking specifically about sustainability um, topics. Um, if you would like to know more about Bio for Products, of course, you can go on our website, follow us on social. As I said, uh, we're happy to field more questions via mail. Um, we're going to distribute these presentations in the next few days so you can uh, look through at your leisure. We'll also put up the recording so you can share that. Um, so yeah, just to say thank you again for participating. Thank you for the to the speakers for their excellent contributions. And uh, yes, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you.